So we are able to use two unemployed layabouts, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mr. Brian Johnson, Mr. Bill Frindle. There they are. <laughs> well, they will, uh, they will be giving us a swing-by-swing swing commentary on the television coverage of today's election. So, now, all of you at home, we want you to switch on your tellies now and turn down the sound on your cellies, of course, on your tellies, of course, and leave... <laughs> <laughs> on your, your bellies, if you've got noisy bellies, aren't you? <laughs> and leave the rest to Brian and Bill. Well, good evening and welcome to BBC Television, BBC One. At the moment, we have Nick Clark of Salford just talking to us. What he's saying, I simply don't know. But it's, <laughs> It's been a very typical day here for us. It's uh, be, had snow and rain. We've had no play before lunch. Uh, we're going to have... Uh, the tea interval isn't until 4 a.m., so I think they're having a pretty tough time down at Television Centre. And the moment Mr Nick Clark's walking across the screen, his lips are moving, mm. and I have no idea <laughs> what he's saying. And now we're in a completely blank room. There's nobody there at all. And this is one of the most exciting bits of cricket I've ever seen. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> With me, I have, uh, with me, I have Bill Frindle, the bearded wonder. He's been spending six months in the British Museum trying to find out something about this uh, election, anything unusual. What's the most unusual thing you found out, Bill? Uh, well, I found out, Brian, that if elected, Margaret Thatcher will be the sixth post-war Prime Minister without a moustache. <laughs> and that must, be, that, must be a, that must be a record for May the 3rd anywhere in England. And now we've got in front of us the Maury Standard Poll. I better not read it out. It looks like a scoreboard of England, 45 for 37. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I just wonder if Bill's also worked out who he thinks is going to win this election. Who do you think's got the best chance? Well, I think Rodney Hogg. <laughs> not Earl Holligans, do you? Any, any other party which you particularly favour? Well, yes, I, I must say the liberal dog lover seems to have cocked a snook at everybody, doesn't he? And, uh, <laughs> Uh, provide us through care. I was hoping that, actually, for both of us, help the aged would have taken part in this, actually. Uh, by the way, Mr. Callan's just voted. He's got one vote. Anyhow, there he is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. We'll be hearing from you later on. Uh, you, can, you can switch your tellies off now, because we have some news about how this programme is being received across the country. Uh, well, Roy, the latest indications suggest that, that some of the listeners have decided to retire early with a good book, or with a friend who's read a good book. Uh, but uh, there is a significant movement of listeners towards the program from the Mozart concert on Radio 3. I think most of them are Mozart. Anyway, uh, we are also seem to be holding on to most of the audience who tuned in expecting this to be kaleidoscope. Uh, there are also encouraging signs that some television viewers are indeed uh, doing as you advise and turning off the sound and turning on the radio. Thank you. Thank you. Well, for those of you who are staying up late tonight in London, the Café Royal will be open till 1am, serving their election special cocktail, which will combine blue, red and orange drinks in coalition. <laughs> As the results come in, the proportions of grenadine, galliano, and blue... that uh, blue stuff? <laughs> <laughs> they will alter to reflect the state of the party. Now, I should think by 1am, everyone there will be a floating voter. But it's been a long campaign. <laughs> it's been a long campaign, and that was a very long joke. Do you remember... Do you remember at the start of it, Keith, the Keith Prowse travel agents advertised a four-day first-class tour around the hustings here? Yeah. Well, apparently they had to cancel it because only three people were interested. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, Jim and David, but there we are. <laughs> Never mind, because the hustings came to us anyway. This Thursday, don't do this day. Don't do this day. And make sure the bidders don't get in. <laughs> Well, and since we've got to be balanced, we'd better hear from the other party. <laughs> don't forget, this Thursday, don't fool. Don't fool. And don't let the fools in. <laughs> I wish David Steele wouldn't talk with his mouth full. There we are now. <laughs> Mind you, it's a, it's a good thing most of them are in cars. They can be pretty dangerous when they gl get close to you, you know. Now, here's, here's a genuine letter. There's a genuine letter written to the Daily Telegraph during this election campaign. Sir, Mrs Thatcher is quite right to condemn the unhygienic custom of baby handling by electioneering parliamentary candidates. 
Many years ago, my son was sitting in his perambulator, harmlessly surveying the sea at Crickyath, when he was patted on the head by Mr. Lloyd George. He was bold before he was 30. <laughs> Well, it must be difficult for a candidate's wife, you know. Her, her husband's out all day making promises to strange women and, <laughs> and answering questions from their husbands. And, you know, it's even worse when the, when the campaign begins. But I must say I admire anyone who, no matter what their convictions, can stand up and hide them for three weeks. I really do. <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course, the BBC have been scrupulously fair during the election. And just to be on the safe side, they've decided not to show the film's Lucky Jim. <laughs> <laughs> A man for all seasons. <laughs> and enter the dragon. <laughs> or enter with drag on. It's entirely up to you. <laughs> In fact, the BBC would like to extend their policy of neutrality to the rest of the country. And during the election, to avoid party bias, no one should wear the colours red, orange or blue until after the government has been elected, when everyone will probably be wearing black anyway. <laughs> in other words, Liverpool Football Club will be, uh, be asked to play in grey. Blackpool would play in brown, and Chelsea would play in secret. <laughs> As they have done for most of this season, but in addition, in addition to the main parties, there's some pretty odd ones. Uh, we can't talk about those that are standing in this election before the polls shut, in case the bloke voting for them decides to stay at home, you know. But one... <laughs> but, but one of the parties standing in the last election, this is absolutely true, was a witchcraft workers' party. <laughs> true. I, I suppose they don't believe in opinion polls, they just cut up a chicken and look at the entrails. You know. <laughs> but uh, talking of entrails, over to our panel... <laughs> Of Peter Cook, Willie Rice, and Alan Corrin and Richard Ingrams for some suggestions about parties that they would like to stand for. Peter. Well, as uh, president and founder of the World Domination League, uh, <laughs> we still aim for complete domination of the world by 1967. <laughs> <laughs> this is our manifesto, and uh, we have stuck by it. Willie, have you anything to say on world issues of importance? We're oh. just going to sit there like a lump of you. <laughs> I'm one of the few people who sit excitingly on radio. <laughs> no need to sit on me, though. It's quite exciting. <laughs> a beard would improve it. That's my business, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> well, a vague idea for a party. I, I, I have a very simple plank, or platform. I'm vaguely anti-ash and pro-heavy drinking. And I, I have this idea that on cigarette packets, it should say that government health warning, smoking can damage your health, but thank you very much for paying for Polaris. <laughs> I, I just want... I just want courtesy in government. A lot of thank you letters. Richard, over to you. Well, I'm remembering uh, William. Uh, but, uh, well, you can hardly forget me. Uh, I've spoken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Had you forgotten me, I'd have suffered an identity uh, crisis. Uh, I, wa I, I wanted to recall the fact that you yourself did uh, indeed once stand as a, as a candidate on the very, very fine course to overthrow Sir Alec Douglas Hume. <laughs> Dates, and uh, it? well, this, uh, this has succeeded. I mean, look at him now. He's... <laughs> I won in the end. You won in the end, like, <laughs> like, like, like all the best things, I think. I think you were ahead of your time. <laughs> and he is. <laughs> <laughs> but he's still alive, and uh, we have a lot to be We don't know with. that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's very controversial. <laughs> Can't say that live on, on the radio. Is it live? We don't there are know. People voting for him now who don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, they probably the do swing. know if they're voting for him. Change sex, Alec. You're with a chance. <laughs> Alan Corrin. Well, having uh, ground one laugh out of lunatics in this clearly malevolent audience, I, I think I should like to extend my platform on that, if I may. I think I would... Um, I think it's appalling that loonies are disenfranchised uh, from voting in elections. They're the only people who are qualified to put a government in power. <laughs> I, 
I think I would like to see a lunatics liberation party. Uh, I'd like to see only loonies entitled to vote at the next election. You would turn up at polling stations, you would say, I'm Napoleon from 14 Acacia Villas. <laughs> and they would say, come in. <laughs> uh, and we would have the people we deserve, and indeed the people we want, and in fact the people we usually get. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now, I've just got to interrupt you there to go live over to the Houses of Parliament. And, oh, what? Here, Jarrett, yes? Have you cleaned behind the Speaker's chair yet? No, not yet, love. I thought you hadn't. Look what I found behind there. Ooh. That's it. I think that was the joke. <laughs> So, no MPs in the Houses of Parliament yet, but we're hoping that some of the newly elected candidates will be round there trying out the cushions early tomorrow morning. And talking of cushions, an important song from Bob Kerr's Whoopi Band that could perhaps be called Dennis Thatcher's Love Song. A blue room, just made for two room, where every day is a holiday because you're married to me. Not just a ballroom, a hall room, a small room where I can smoke my pipe away with your wee head upon my knee. We'll survive on, keep alive on, just nothing but kisses. We're Mr. and Mrs. on little blue chairs. So your Trousseau and Robinson Crusoe Was not so far from worldly cares As in our blue room away upstairs in our blue room away upstairs. That was a party political broadcast on behalf of the Keep Music Dead party, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, any, any, any reaction? <laughs> any reaction to that? Yes, well, uh, thank you, Roy. Uh, there has been a slight shift towards the programme from Radio 1, uh, balanced by a little last-minute retuning from listeners who had earlier moved over from Radio 3. So, as the actress said to the bishop, <laughs> sorry, no significant change. <laughs> Well, we're getting very close now to the moment when the polls close. And as usual, there'll be great competition to see who gets the first result in. And, of course, there will also be great competition between ITV and BBC as to who is going to be the most surprised when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are those other seats that will be seen as vital indicators. It, it's been said that what the men and women of Bolton East do tonight will be repeated throughout the country. <laughs> Which should be a damn sight more fun than watching the election results anyway. <laughs> but one good thing, though, whatever the result, we'll see less of politicians for a while. Now, they've all been so boring, I hear there's been a massive slump in the Mogadon shares, but there we are. <laughs> and, they... <laughs> and they never say what they mean, do they? So here are some translations of a few basic political phrases. No, no, no. Translated means... Yes, yes, yes. In the fullness of time... Never... 
Never in a month of Sundays. In just under two years. Well, um, in just under two years. Never. <laughs> On this issue, there are no easy answers. Ask me an easier question. <laughs> now, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked me that. You slimy git. <laughs> Yeah, uh, frankly, frankly, I am not in the least concerned by the latest trend in the opinion polls. Help. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, the European agricultural policy with its fiscal flow problems and the stagnation of the green pound at 6.71%. Uh, uh, Help. <laughs> a promise is a promise. A promise is a meaningless anagram of primrose with the R taken out. <laughs> And finally, one you'll hear MPs say all over the country after the results have been declared. <laughs> well, of course, you can prove anything with statistics. I lost. <laughs> well, the televisions are now warming up all over the country, ready for the pundits to come on, you know. I'll never forget the first time I saw Ludwig Kennedy in our front room at election time. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't buy his own set, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> But now, will you once again at home turn your tellies on and turn down the sound for a look at how the pundits are shaping up over again to a B. Johnson and B. Brindle. <laughs> well, at the in moment, the weather doesn't box. look too good, but Richard Baker's just come back. And we're waiting now for the team, for the BBC One to take the field, headed by David Dimbleby and Angela Rippon, known as Dimbers and Rippers, and they'll be coming out here. <laughs> And they, of course, have with them Robert McKenzie, Robin Day and David Butler, a fine team, this. And we're hoping they won't make too many slips or perhaps they won't make too many silly points. But it's very nice to see Angela Rippon, and we shall see her in a moment. And I can assure you tonight she'll be having two fine legs when she comes on. Uh, uh, do you think it's ever been quite as boring as this ever? Do you think... Well, <laughs> yes, Brian. Uh, May the 22nd, 1955, is extremely boring when 49.7% of all the votes went to the same party. Utterly confusing because nobody voted for any of the others. Well, now we've just got an awful lot of X's on the thing, and there's a face appearing. <laughs> and, uh, it looks like a map of England, and there's another face. It looks like Mr. Seal, and we're going to have decision now. And this is going to be very exciting indeed, decision 79. Um, there is old Dimbers himself, and he's just starting, <laughs> starting his innings, and he'll be introducing all the various gadgets they have in the studio tonight, and this is going to be something quite uh, unusual, I think. First of all, we've got the eighth year of the swingometer, and the swingometer this year has a grey area, if you know what that means. Do you, Rich, um, <laughs> we're, uh, we're, yes, yes, John. Uh, ah, yes, and I, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Freddie and, Truman. And there and is a swingometer. <laughs> And we hope it won't run out like it did once and the two men in brown coats had to come and make an extra thing on the one side of it. And there's Mr. Mackenzie there. And there is Angela, looking very nice today, wearing her creams there. She's looking very nice indeed. That, that's and, still uh, David Dimbleby. Oh, is it? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there is... Oh, the... no, it isn't. Oh, <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> and David Butter, the physiologist, or whatever it's called. Can you pronounce that? And he's going to sit there and tell no, us exactly why what's not to attempt the French has. accent. Yes. So there, well, that's the scene here in the studio, and I can tell you they've also <laughs> got. <laughs> and there is Mr. Day, the demon bowler. And I... <laughs> I think someone's just dropped one. Yes, he's catch. got some bounces tonight, I bet. <laughs> uh. And in addition to the studio, they've also got 50 loudspeakers. Sounds like a gaggle of commentators. Sounds it? like Fred Truman. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Now, a quick word from our panel about the media coverage of this election. Could we have? I think I I I think I think the media coverage has been, 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 has been. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to be asked anything now. I've got it all crossed out on my script. Hasn't David Butler aged? Doesn't he look old now? I remember David Butler when he was young. Do you remember him yes, when he was young? Yes, Richard, yes. over to you. And David Butler when he was young. Yes. He <laughs> looks knackered now, doesn't he? <laughs> Why? Forget it. I don't know what you were, you were supposed to say something about the media coverage. Uh, well, yeah. I just changed the subject. Uh, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> no, I, was, I was just thinking how, how, what a good idea it would be if, if, if as well as voting between for, for Callan and Thatcher, you could vote for Robin Day and um, uh, vote him out of, uh, out of the BBC and have someone else. <laughs> I mean, he's going to be there year after year. At least, old, uh, you know, someone might lose the general election <laughs> uh, at this moment in time. I mean... 
Um, you're, looking, you're looking at me, Ingrams. You want to be saved. You want a life raft. Don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, I have nothing to say, nothing to say about media coverage, except that it's been appalling. They've insisted been on been covering all of them. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there's not been a moment when some uh, fearful mug hasn't been... Uh, the only thing that, uh, that excited me about the media coverage was the fact that Satcher has been turning into Macmillan. I think it's... Um, <laughs> it's either Satcher and Satcher or Gordon Reese, but her eyes have been getting gradually doggier. <laughs> as it's, and I, <clears throat> I don't know whether it's a screen or whether it's central office. I would think that if she doesn't win at this campaign, they'll probably shave her head and stick a cigar in a gob for next time. <laughs> Alan Corrin saves us again, folks. There we are. Now, <laughs> and I've just received, I've just received some, some of the results from, of, of our studio poll. In case it has an undue influence, I won't be revealing the main results until after the polling station is closed. But I can tell you that of the men, 22% are to the right. T- <laughs> 28% are to the left. And 49% are wearing jeans, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> And I see that leaves 1% don't know. Now, we'll be see how that's borne out across the country later this evening, but now it's just coming up to 10 o'clock. We'll be back after the polls and the pubs are shut in about 10 minutes' time. It's 10 o'clock. The voting is over. The countdown to number 10 has begun. Thank you very much and welcome to part two of Why Vote is Only Encouragement. This is Peter Cook and now straight over for some more Balls Up by Balls Up commentary of uh, <laughs> the coverage with Brian and Bill. Brian. Well, the scoring's just started and it's going to be very exciting to see what's going to happen. But at the moment we're watching Mike Yarwood and just now we saw Mr. Callan come to the door of number 10 and greet some carol singers. What he said to them, I don't know, but by the look on his lips it wasn't anything too polite. Uh, what do you think about it, Bill? Well, he's only allowed one bouncer and over and I think that's where Mark Margaret Thatcher comes in. And, and, and there is Mike Yarwood himself coming up on our screen, and we shall be seeing all the swingometers coming into operation later. Meanwhile, it's Mike Yarwood on the screen, and I uh, can't think what he's saying at all. No, I can't read his lips. It's very difficult. Uh, we do sometimes from the commentary box imagine what bowlers are saying when they've missed... Um, but uh, sometimes we can't repeat what we think they're saying. And uh, I think on this occasion, I don't know what uh, Mike Yarwood is saying at all. Can you gather? Well, I remember when Michael Holding was bowling to Peter Willey once, and you said, My, uh, Holdy, um, the, the, bowler's hold, <laughs> the bowler's holding the batsman's Willey, and the lady phoned in and said it wasn't That's right. right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's not that, anyway. And I also... <laughs> <laughs> it's also I can't see Ray Illingworth because last year I said Ray Illingworth just relieved himself of the pavilion end. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is Mike Arwood sitting in a chair, and I don't know if he's now going to tell us what's going on. I can't quite read his lips again. No, it's very, very, very it's, difficult to gather. It's definitely last season's wig, isn't it? It's before they <laughs> changed the overrate. He, actually, another couple of shows he's entitled to a new wig, isn't he? Yes, I it's think a, he is. Anyhow, I think he's definitely going to appeal to the audience here. Doesn't and, appeal uh, to me. No. We won't see him run out with any luck, I don't suppose. And um, there we are. He's going on talking, and I'm going to stop for a change. 
<laughs> Thank you, the Mike and Bernie of Lords. What a lovely team. <laughs> Peter. Well, now we're allowed to say anything we like, aren't we? Um, yes. I, I think uh, I should declare my uh, voting intentions. Uh, I plan uh, to go out immediately after this and uh, support my uh, local... Uh, to support my local, in fact, <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, I might as well come out straight with it. I'm a gay liberal and... Um, <laughs> I have voted for a well-hung parliament. <laughs> Alan, any thoughts? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, only one thought springs to mind, uh, Peter. I, I just look at my watch. I went out early this morning. I voted for him at ten past eight. It's ten past ten. They've done sod all so far. <laughs> I voted, I have to tell you, we can talk about all these swine now. It's been weeks and it's terrible. It's like, it's like suddenly coming out of the monastery. You go mad for a moment. Uh, I voted at Hendon South, that being my constituency, and we are unique in having the only Jewish National Front candidate. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a man, or he can be described as a man, called, called Anthony Elder. And I presume that if he's elected, he will annex Hendon North and march on Mecca. <laughs> I, 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 if, he, if he is listening and I'm trying to use monosyllabic words so that they will get through to him I... what did you say his name was then? Elder, oh, Elder. One, oh, one, of the, one of the elders of Zion one of the... <laughs> uh, you sorry, sorry recognise him by the, the scrape marks on his knuckles <laughs> <laughs> not from not from the other candidates, but from the ground. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about to Hendon South. But there are 634 other constituencies. Uh, Richard, you must have something to say. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm probably the only person here who's actually involved in this election in, in a professional capacity. That is, I, I was the campaign manager of the Dog Lovers Party. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, thank you. Woof, woof, woof. He did thank very you. well. They pissed all over his leg. You can see it. <laughs> I didn't, uh... Good heavens, they've changed producers uh, again. The sackings uh, here are... <laughs> Please stand up and let him walk off the platform. I didn't, I didn't actually go to the constituency because I was advised that I might be a... there might be a security risk there if I, if I was to show my face. So I kept a low profile throughout, as indeed did the candidate and his dogs. <laughs> I like, I like the uh, Labour candidate it's called Mr Knott and he's been rushing around his constituency and saying to people, shaking them all by the hand and saying, I'm not your Labour candidate. <laughs> <laughs> he should do better than the Liberal actually, there's a Liberal called Attack and uh, he just wanders around saying, attack your Liberal candidate. <laughs> The worst thing that happened to me was going to see the boys from Brazil and coming home and seeing Sir Keith Joseph on the screen and thinking, my word, it's the clone of Goebbels. <laughs> <laughs> well, more from the panel, ladies and gentlemen, later on. Now, I'm just going to interrupt you there because we're going over now to a polling station where counting has just begun. Ah, oh, that's one for us. Oh, that's one for them. <laughs> another one for us. <laughs> oh, these are all for them. <laughs> for the listeners at home, the visual saved that one, ladies and gentlemen. There we are. <laughs> and in fact, and in fact I, I've just got news that the first result is coming through. It's from Rockall and surrounding areas, and it's come in just 16 and a half minutes after the polls closed. And so I duly declare Andrew David Selkirk Robertson to be elected the candidate for this constituency in this election, the 10th of October, 
Well, in fact, the final result from the last election in there, but back to this election, and we've just heard that Margaret Thatcher is the first party leader to make her victory speech. Good evening, subjects. <laughs> Let me begin my victory speech by thanking the millions and millions of highly intelligent people who voted for me. And to those partly blind few who didn't vote for me, <laughs> let me make it quite clear that I do not intend to gloat. <laughs> Tough cheese, eh? <laughs> now, I know, of course, that technically speaking, I am not yet Prime Minister. But as my dear old grandmother used to say, you don't have to see the sun to know that morning will inevitably follow night. She used to say that all the time. <laughs> Even after they'd locked her up. <laughs> I must say, now I must say that standing here on the most exciting night in my life since my honeymoon, <laughs> standing here on the most exciting night in my life. <laughs> I can't help thinking back to the dawning of my political awareness. I remember my first public speaking engagement. It was in the Sixth Form Debating Society, and I was proposing the motion, this house would rather be dead than red. And I must have been jolly convincing, because during my 13-hour speech, five people shot themselves. <laughs> but when I think of my first day in Parliament, I'll never forget how Harold Macmillan came up to me, took me quietly to one side and said, For God's sake, Quentin, take that dress off. <laughs> Then I suppose the next big stepping stone was being appointed Minister for Education for Ted Heath. I was a great success. Within six months, Ted could almost spell. <laughs> and now, now I stand on the edge of destiny. And when I think of Britain's appalling crisis, when I think of the soaring rates of inflation and the slump of sterling, when I think that I'll have to deal with all those problems, I think, I, I think, I think I need a stiff brandy. Good night. <laughs> Well, the first victory speech there from the Tories, who have probably fought the most razzmatazz campaign in this election. They even installed a dial a manifesto service, you know, on the lines of dial a recipe. I tried it. <laughs> they had a new one every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, and, of course, there were other publicity stunts. Can you hold the calf up a little bit higher, Mrs That's Thatcher? It. Lovely, lovely. Could we have the calf a bit more to the left, please, Mrs Thatcher? That's it. Super, That's super. Lovely. Could we have a quote, please? <laughs> Thank you. And one from the cow. <laughs> Peter, I have here, he leads into a discussion. Oh, I'll lead, I lead into a discussion here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just going into this discussion. I, I, yeah, I, th I think, it's, I think it's very nice to have Mrs Thatcher going around uh, picking up uh, little calves and things like that, don't you? Oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Beats so knits. <laughs> <laughs> Does she... Oh, she does. Does, does she beat nits? Oh, yes, no. I, I, I heard she, I heard she <laughs> beat nits once in a while. The I, clear I conviction sure was... on this programme that the Tories have got in because they're not hammering anybody else. You can feel the mood that Satter is in, his open house to, to stamp on them. I feel a new dawn. I feel uh, a new, <laughs> new satirical... <laughs> Breaking. The satirical dawn is breaking. Yeah, this wonderful yeah, manageress yeah. from Derry and Toms is going to represent us in the... Uh, <laughs> in the great courts of the world. I wonder what Brezhnev is thinking. Do you think Brezhnev is sweating over his Kremlin commode, <laughs> wondering how it's going to turn up? Do you think all those, all those villainous carters are walking up and down the... I should think they're feeling there's a new dawn uh, coming along too. 
I think Did Brezhnev you? actually. Dawn? Did you did you see Did you see Brezhnev the other day on the telly? He, he was, was um, waving. They were holding his hand. They were. They were. They were <laughs> he's been. He's got all these terrible um, tubes going into him, and <laughs> doctors wandering around and injecting him. And uh, I hope that happens to whoever wins. <laughs> I don't really. I'm very kind. I like him all, Willie. You're a bitter person. Say something <laughs> nasty. I, I thought the single most brilliant stroke in the whole election was Callan, who actually got Wilson onto the front page of the Mail saying that Margaret was great, which caused, I think, 10% off in the next opinion poll. I don't know what Wilson was playing at because it, the last quote that they had on, on the ITN News last night was, was Wilson's quote saying that Callahan uh, is a major figure in the mould of Baldwin. Now, whatever, whatever mould there is on Baldwin... <laughs> <laughs> the last place you want it transferred is to your great and wonderful leader, I would have thought. Willie Whitelaw was very controversial during the campaign again. Uh, I liked his thing when he said uh, he accused the Labour Party of rushing around the country, stirring up apathy. <laughs> What, Talking why? of apathy, I, I just have to interrupt you there because we've just heard that Berkeley have returned their Labour candidate. They say they want another one. <laughs> <laughs> and now here's a, here is an explanation of the radio swingometer. Uh, well, Roy, with our special swingometer, if you hear a... Uh, then that'll mean a swing to the Labour. And if you hear a... <laughs> uh, then that's a swing to the Tories. If you hear a... Hooch my nip. Then that's a swing to the Scottish Nationalists. If you hear a... Uh, then a candidate has lost his deposit. And if you hear a... <laughs> uh, then that means we're going to have a hung parliament. <laughs> Yeah, that was it. That was it. Unfortunately, no visual there to save that one, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and now a further interruption to bring you another song from Bob Kerr's Whoopi Band. <laughs> Jim, what do you think of him? He's doing his best to stay out of the left, but we know where he has been. Just cast your vote, cast your vote. in their direction. Call me, oh my, me, oh my. Who wants election? They do, cause they're all the same. They've just got a different name. Once they got your cross, they don't give a toss. Half your wages they will pay. Now you might have to feel a bit for Mr. Steele. Cause of the big three he's still very wee Speaking quite liberally <laughs> There are many more But I find it all a bore Red, orange or blue it's up to you But don't come bothering me Just cast your vote In their direction Oh me oh my Who wants elections? They do Cause they're all the same They've just got a different name Once they got your cross They don't give a toss Your wages they will pay Curse, whoopee band, and so they should be, folks. There we are. 
Uh, but we're back just in time. We're back just in time to hear the victory message from the head and the shoulders of the Labour Party. We won the cup. We won the cup. Hey, oh, yeah, dear. We won the cup. Well, it looks like I've won again. You lucky people. And before I do a lap of honour around Lord Goodman, I'd just like to thank the people who made my victory possible. My colleagues, Labour Party workers, you, the suck the voters. <laughs> Wedgie for keeping his trap shut. <laughs> and above all, Sarchi and Sarchi for doing for Margaret Thatcher what Mixomatosis did for rabbits. <laughs> oh dear, top that private eye. <laughs> you know, a lot of people keep asking me what I would have done if I'd lost the election. The answer's simple. Confronted by the undeniable will of the people, I would have had no choice but to go to the Queen and solemnly ask her to make it best out of three. <laughs> Still, won't have to now. This inevitable Labour victory proves that the people saw I was offering a cure for inflation. They saw I was promising a fair deal for pensioners, and they saw I was promising to safeguard living standards. What they didn't see was that I had my fingers crossed all the time. <laughs> oh, dear, you have to laugh, don't you? <laughs> you know, it seems like only yesterday that I decided to go into politics. Well, it was either that or get a job. <laughs> How well I recall... How uh, well I recall the first time I spoke in Parliament. Clem Attlee came up to me and said he'd much appreciated my maiden speech as the sleep had really done him good. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, I suppose my first big break was in 1964. I was given a very important and busy post in Harold Wilson's cabinet. Yes, I was minister responsible for picking up George Brown. <laughs> Oh, yes. Harold Wilson, what a personality. All 92 of them. <laughs> Still, he abdicated and I succeeded. King James III. Of course, looking ahead, I must say, quite bluntly, times will be hard. I'll see to that. <laughs> anyway, never fear, Jim is here. And you know, I never was in doubt that I'd win this election. No doubt at all. Now, you must excuse me. I've got to ring Pickford's to get them to bring my furniture back. <laughs> Good night. Well, Mr Callaghan, noisily confident there, obviously believing that the high proportion in the opinion polls of don't knows indicates that many people agree with the government. <laughs> Someone who's... No, let's hand over for something you've said. A discussion, Peter. Would you like to discuss something? I, I'd like to discuss oh, I something. I, I, I think that whoever loses should do, follow the example of Mr. Sitoli. Mr. Namanga Sitoli. <laughs> who said, what is this election? <laughs> who is this Thatcher? <laughs> <laughs> who is this Callahan? <laughs> who is this... They are not representative at all. I want to recount. <laughs> This is what I am doing. <laughs> Mr. Citoli is not at all such and that he has lost. And so he is saying that very directly. And quite right too. Really. <laughs> the whole thing. The whole thing. I've just been handed a slip of paper. <laughs> It, oh, dear, it was I'm, from I'm, me, I'm, I'm, if I'm, you don't I'm, mind. I don't like those sort of jokes. I haven't libeled Mr. Nabanga Sitoli. I'd hate to do that. We're talking about silly parties, aren't we? Let's have one. <laughs> yes. I, I, I was merely... I, I wasn't going to say anything. I was merely going to thank the BBC for asking me here without them. So I could have been at home listening to this. It's a bit early. <laughs> <laughs> I, was saying, I was going to say, this is one of the silliest parties I, I've ever been to. <laughs> What it's all about. Being Chelsea born, I was deeply impressed by one candidate who stood for Chelsea for the Trepanist party, which is boring a hole in your skull like Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> she 
she actually performed, it's in the paper, performed the operation on herself some nine years ago in order to expand her consciousness. But then she laid down her Black & Decker and now says it was actually quite a silly thing to do, but she does believe the whole and able to everybody enormous good. And I think that makes a fine leader, somebody who actually leads from the front, <laughs> bores the whole in the head and then changes her mind. <laughs> this is what we're going to get, probably. If she gets in. I wonder what the percentage of the voters are now regretting their decision. It's only 35 minutes in. There is a statement here from the head of the British Astrological Psychic Society, and he predicts an absolute majority of five for Mrs Thatcher. This is borne out... Uh, five something or other. <laughs> she is borne out by something or other. Yes. I think it's appalling that the convicts aren't allowed to vote. I mean, they're... <laughs> Stuck there with their bowl of gruel, watching <laughs> Who else educational is television, and uh, they're the, really the only people to whom it matters which Parliament's in power. I mean, they're going to decide whether it's overcrowded or whether the fat is going to come in and hang them all at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Poor buggers sitting there on parking offences. You reckon they're going to be tops tomorrow? <laughs> Having in, or, or worse, Lord Longford will come in and visit them. <laughs> I, of course, many, many of them are MPs. I, I, think, I think we should point that. Out. <laughs> or at least ex-MPs. Uh, I, I, I think having in my bid kind of on behalf of the lunatics, I think I'll put it in for the convicts. I think we'll enfranchise the convicts as well. I would like to see the polling booths next time out full of these blokes in arrowed suits, <clears throat> stealing the pencils. <laughs> but I, wa- I wonder, Richard, whether this will, uh, this election will pass uh, the international standards which have uh, been laid down by the United Nations. I noticed a certain amount of pressure going on around the polling booths. That's never so Wives were saying to husbands, <laughs> you're trying to work out my accent, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Get in there and vote. Now, is this legal or not? <laughs> it's a rear view of Ian Paisley, I think. <laughs> well, on that uh, his best side. This is, is his prettiest side, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid I have to leap in there, not into a rear view of Ian Paisley, but I have to, le- <laughs> <laughs> have to leap in here to bring you one of the high spots of the Liberal campaign. Uh, right, can we just have one photograph of the whole of the Liberal Party now, please? Uh, thank you. Can, can we have Cyril Smith on one side, please? And the rest of Cyril Smith on the other side. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Pardo, you can't stand there. You're almost blocking Mr Thorpe. Could you move over a bit that way? Ah, that's better. You've completely blocked him now. <laughs> <laughs> the original version was better for the listeners at home, but there we are, you know. <laughs> over now, for the, for the last time... <laughs> Let's go for the last time to Brian Johnson and Bill for a look at how things are shaping up on television and how they look like developing throughout the night. Well, the one, oh, oh. <laughs> the one I'm looking at is developing very well. It's that lovely girl from ABBA, and she's highly developed, overexposed, useful in a dark room. That's why they call her <laughs> a photographic sort of girl. And uh, at the moment, the count's going on. All the scorers are adding up the scores. I don't know what you make out the result, Bill Frindle. Oh, can you tell me what day it is, Brian? <laughs> yes, well, it's going right on, right through the night. And all I can say is I hope whoever wins has a, a long stop at number 10. I don't know if that's any good at all. No, it isn't much, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> and at the moment, we're not watching anything political. We're watching ABBA play, and uh, I'd like to go on watching them play. I think they're marvellous. I wish we could I think they'd them. probably win. Yes, I think... <laughs> All we can say to them is, have a good time. And, uh, <laughs> and I, th- I don't know if you know what Margaret Thatcher told her ladies at the Conservative Conference at um, Albert Hall. She had all the ladies there in their lovely hats. And she said, ladies, we've taken it lying down long enough. From now on, we must stand up with our backs to the wall. <laughs> All right, back in your basket, you swine. <laughs> now, as I told you earlier, folks, we carried out an opinion poll with our audience, and uh, here are some of the questions we asked them. Which film character would you like to see Jim Callahan play? A. Moses. B. Charlton Heston. C. Charlton Moses. Or D. Tarka the Otter. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, well, there's loads of beer. This is quite nice. Uh, here's, here's an interesting one. Do you think this country gets the government it deserves? <laughs> if so, say what you personally did to get Heath, Wilson and Callaghan. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. Which, which, foreign country would you, which foreign country would you most like to live in after the general election? <laughs> The left wing are marvellous. I don't know what's happened to the right wing. <laughs> Any world of their own over there. Here's a good one. Which leading member of the cabinet suffers from rigor mortis? <laughs> <laughs> Which leading member of the shadow cabinet does not suffer from rigor mortis? <laughs> oh, good, clever stuff. And here are some of the answers to our studio, Pon. I'll leave out the boring ones, but... Uh, uh, the answer to question four, what do you think is Mrs. Thatcher's special appeal? 34% put the fact that she reminds me of my mother. 24% put the fact that she is my mother. <laughs> and 6% put the fact that she reminds me of my father. <laughs> One wag put the fact is that she reminds me to vote Labour. <laughs> and to question five, what would be your main platform if you were to stand as an MP? The overwhelming majority put platform nine, Charing Cross Station. <laughs> Question six. If your MP didn't get elected, what job would you like to see him in? 100% put an unemployed MP. <laughs> Bloody witty audience there, I see. <laughs> Which person would you most like to see as Prime Minister? Choose the Harry Worth. we got here. Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Roy Hard. Good, I like that. Champion the Wonder Horse. John Travolta. The most ludicrous suggestion in the lot. David Steele. Well, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's almost all out from why voted only encourage them. One observation, though, this election has been complicated by having one set of votes for the local election and another for the general election. Trying to get it right is like having to go at a fruit machine, really, isn't it? Except the difference is, whatever you put on your ballot paper, you always come up with a row of lemons. Good night. That was why vote, it only encourages them. Canvassing for your votes were our candidates Roy Hart, Peter Cook, Willie Rushton, Richard Ingrams and Alan Corrin. With the help of loudspeakers, David Jason, Chris Emmett and Janet Brown. Political anthems were provided by Bob Kerr's Whoopi Band, with commentary by Brian Johnson and Bill Frindle. The speeches were written by the Richard Nixon All-Stars, including Clive Anderson, Alistair Beaton, Barry Bowes, Andy Hamilton, Steve Hancock, Guy Jenkins, John Lloyd, Jimmy Mulville, Barry Pilton and Bill Nesbesma. And the programme was researched by Don't Know, Simon Rose and Mary Roberts and produced by computer with the help of Alan Nixon and Jeffrey Perkins. Well, we'll hear a lot more applause tonight, but it won't have a musical backing. This is Brian Redhead in the Radio 4 Election Studio, and we begin now, seriously, the countdown to number 10.